And so I get to introduce First Timothy to you today, and I'm going to take five or ten minutes to introduce the book, and then we are going to dive into chapter one. So if you've got your Bible with you, open it to First Timothy. If you've got your phone with you, make sure it's on silent. Open up your Bible app and uh, type in First Timothy so that you're there in the Scriptures when we get there. The introduction of the book is easy to do. It's simple. We all know who Paul was. Uh, the apostle to the Gentiles wrote half of the New Testament, and quite early on in his apostolic ministry, he encountered a young man by the name of Timothy, and you can read about their uh, initial encounter and the formation of their relationship in Acts chapter 16. And Timothy had a Greek father and a Jewish mother, and he was uh, born and bred in the town of Lystra, and he had a good reputation in the church and in the town and even in that region. At that stage, he was a, a young man, likely in his 20s, and Paul was in the, the prime of his energy, likely in his 40s, and Paul wanted Timothy to travel with him, to be on his team. And it was Paul's position always to clear as many obstacles to the gospel out of the way as what he possibly could. He never wanted to fight unnecessary battles. He spent his time building bridges and taking down barriers. And as he traveled, he knew that he would be going often into the Jewish communities in the various towns. He himself was a Jew, and Timothy was uncircumcised. And so the first real evening of discussion about joining the team that they had in Timothy's home. Uh, we presume from bits and pieces that we glean here and there that Timothy's mother and grandmother might have been present. They were godly ladies who raised Timothy in the faith. And Paul explained that the first job, uh, unlike raising support if you want to join the Logos Hope, the first job was to be circumcised. And so Acts chapter 16 tells us that Paul went and circumcised Timothy. It's unlikely that he personally did it with a bread knife down the passage. It's much more likely that he fed him into the religious system of the day so that it would be well established amongst the Jews that Timothy was circumcised because the idea was to be able to take the gospel to the Jews without this huge stumbling block in the way. So that's how the relationship starts. And then Timothy joins Paul on his apostolic or missionary journeys. And he, he's an important role player. He co-authors, is there with the writing of several of the letters. When you get to the end of the letter, it will tell you, Timothy's with me, and he sends greetings. On other occasions, Timothy was sent carrying letters. On other occasions, Timothy was sent by Paul to deal with situations in the churches. And Paul is overt in the scriptures of his view of Timothy. He calls him a son in the Lord. And not everybody that Paul raised up was called a son. A son, a spiritual son is not a category. A spiritual son is a description of someone who draws close to a father figure in the faith and is raised by them. And amongst the sons that Paul had, Timothy was not the only one it seems that Timothy was the closest to his spiritual father. Because Timothy, Paul literally says of Timothy, I have no one else like him. I'm sending him to you because he is the one that represents me best. He knows what I believe. He knows what I would do. He knows my gospel. I trust him implicitly. Receive him as you would receive me. So this very close relationship over the best part of two decades and it's interesting, this is just an aside, a, a, a little bunny trail, but it's interesting that when Paul gets near the end of his life, and you can pick this up very strongly in 2 Timothy, that Paul still had no clear succession plan in place. And if Paul had thought like most of the, the church thinks today, then 
leaders that have a lot of influence and have a lot of power, when they reach the end of their lives, they start trying to figure out how to protect their legacy and how to appoint some sort of spiritual son that will continue their legacy. But you know that Paul did none of that. And so Timothy is the most likely successor to Paul. And Paul never even ever tries to appoint him as a successor. And I'm saying this because it is so important for us to grasp that the church belongs to Jesus, not to the leaders. And that there is ultimately no baton to pass. Because the baton is not in the hands of the leaders, it's in the hands of the Lord. And we're not worried about anybody's legacy. We're worried about Jesus' legacy. And over the last couple of years, you as a congregation have taken enormous strides in that direction, dismantling the hierarchy pyramid and moving to a far more biblical view of church government. And I just really want to commend you. It takes a great deal of courage when everybody else does one thing and you do another out of deep conviction because you're misunderstood and nobody's quite sure what is going on. But what has happened in this house has been a very healthy thing because you have changed, you've taken great strides and, and transformed the way you think about leadership in biblical ways and you need to be commended for it and you need to hold the line on it even if it's uncomfortable and tricky to work out. And I'm not going to spend um, too much time there. I think there are other things that are in the heart of the Lord for this morning. But as you work your way through First and Second Timothy, many of these leadership issues can be explored in more detail. And you can discover that it is possible to structure churches in accordance with the things that Jesus said. Do you remember he said, whatever you do, don't be like everybody else. Don't have leadership structures that lord it over you. Don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like the Babylonians. And too much of church has Babylonian structure, and I'm being really provocative now, these great leadership pyramids that one has to climb if you want to have influence or power. And Jesus said, whatever you do, don't do that. Don't take titles. Don't call each other pastor this and father that. Jesus is Lord. And leadership serves. The pyramid is turned upside down. And leadership serves. And so in the relationship of Paul and Timothy, you see the beauty of a seasoned apostle who invests his life in Timothy but does not lift Timothy up into any kind of ruling elite. Because in his understanding, Paul's understanding, there was no place for that in the church. Only one king in the building, and it's Jesus. And leaders serve. Uh, and so, as you go through the books, there will be many opportunities to deal with leadership issues. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to publicly commend you and to commend your leadership. Well done. We are now 15 to 20 years on from Timothy's circumcision. And we are now with Paul approaching 60 years of age or 60 years of age, and Timothy is around 40 years of age. And in the context and the culture, 40 was still young. So when Paul writes to Timothy and he says, let no one despise you about your youth, it wasn't because there was a 19-year-old, pimply 19-year-old with incomplete beard running around. It was because even at 40, in the prime of his, of his energy and strength as a man, he would still have been regarded as young. And Paul now writes to Timothy, and it's quite tricky to synthesize 1 Timothy and the book of Acts, because the book of Acts closes with Paul in prison in Rome, but it's likely, it's possible, I'm not going to fight you on this, but it's possible that Paul was released from prison in Rome and that he had a fourth missionary journey to Macedonia, to northern Greece, and that he wrote from Macedonia to Timothy, who was in Ephesus, and that Paul now wrote 1 Timothy. And he tells us in the first chapter 
why he's writing. He says, Timothy, I want you to stay in Ephesus, and I want you to ensure that everything is put and kept in order. And so, much of the book touches on governmental issues. What do you look for when you're looking for leaders? How should we conduct ourselves? How should we pastor the various categories of people in the church? There's so much practical wisdom. There is so much to learn, and that's why you're going to be spending the balance of 2024 going through these scriptures. They will be of great value to you. But today, I'm not going to touch any of that stuff. Today, I'm going to stay in the personal relationship between Paul and Timothy. And we're going to look at chapter 1. And in chapter 1, Paul is going to say something that is rare. I will take you to a few other passages of Scripture in which he says a similar thing. But it's rare, and we're going to focus on it because it's rare. And we're going to focus on it because it applies to every single one of us so powerfully. So let's go to the text now. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first verse, and then I'm going to take you down to verse 12. Your homework, by the way, is to read the whole book this week. Go and read the whole book of 1 Timothy, and go and read chapter 1, digest it, go and prod around in your commentaries and your study Bibles, and chew through some of the things that I'm not touching. But here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy. And then down to verse 12, Paul says, I thank Him, and this is now the Lord, who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hallelujah, aren't you glad? Because all of us once were sinners, and He saved us. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and then this extraordinary statement, of whom I am the foremost. But Paul, there are so many other passages that say that this is not true. You wrote to the Corinthians and you said that if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has what? Gone, passed away, and the new has come. Paul, it was fine for you to say that you used to be a persecutor. You used to operate in unbelief. It's fine for you to say what is in the past, but how can you say, I am the foremost of sinners? Paul, you're contra contradicting so much other scripture. What are you up to, Paul? And you can go and check it in the Greek. That I am is ego eimi. It's present tense, I am. Remember Jesus in the Gospel of John, the seven great I am statements? Well, yeah, Paul is using that language. He's saying, I am. And he's saying, I am the foremost of sinners. Foremost, protos. Sometimes protos means first in priority. Sometimes it means first in sequence. Clearly, Adam sinned before Paul did. <laughs> and so the interpretation here is foremost, primary. Some of the translations say, I'm the chief of sinners. And this is in contradiction to so many other statements in Scripture. And yet, yeah, Paul is writing, and he's writing to, to Timothy, this young apostle. Timothy's about 40 years old. Timothy's going to face great challenges in Ephesus. Paul is encouraging him to fan into flame the gift that is in him, to not be 
uh, not let anybody look down on him because he's young. He's speaking courage into Timothy. He's reminding him that he's called of God. Timothy is going to have a rough ride in, in Ephesus. Paul did. Paul wrote of his visit there, I faced wild beasts. And he didn't mean lions and tigers and cockroaches and the ants that we have in East London. He meant opposition from men and in the spirit realm. Remember, it was to the Ephesian church that he wrote, put on the full armor of God. Take your stand against principalities and powers. So now Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he's speaking from the heart to his son in the Lord, and he's preparing him to stand, to run his race well. And he says to him, Timothy, I am an apostle appointed by God, loved by God, Grace and faith have been poured out on me. I've received strength. I've received mercy. He's not confused about who he is. But he now says this extraordinary thing. He says, I'm also the chief of sinners. Let's just read for the sake of completion a little further. Verse 16. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so Paul tells us why he has this duality, this dilemma. And in case you're thinking, Paul, what are you on about? You have the same problem. You are born again of the Spirit of God. You are a new creation, and a new creation in every way. The the old has passed away. That's true of you. And at the same time, (laughs) there are a whole bunch of us who could say, Paul, we also feel like the chief of sins. And we live with our humanity. We live with the life of God in us. And there are some days that we are sure that we are singing with the angels. We are so in touch with the life of God. And there are other days that we are back into the drain of our past. And we are the chief of sinners, and it's a reality. And at the very least, there's your body. And on the days that your body is in trouble, on the days, guys, that we have bad flu, and we are sure that they are going to bury us within 48 hours. We all know that man flu is worse than woman flu. You ladies can keep going, packing school lunches, going to work, cleaning the house, doing the washing ironing. You can power through flu because lady flu is sissy flu, ninny flu, flu light. But when us guys get flu, we get man flu. We get flu with a hairy chest. We get flu with big biceps and a six-pack. And we're sure we're going to die. When we're, when we're in touch with our bodies and we're in touch with our humanity and it's a fallen world and the car is broken and the tumble dryer is broken, and the washing machine is, is leaking and we've got man flu and the wife is nagging and the kids are screaming and the bank account is empty, we are so aware of our humanity, our fallenness, our brokenness, our weakness. And then we go to church and some guy says, right, we're going to break through this morning. And we find it very difficult to step in to new creation realities, which are true true of us. I'm going to give you another passage of Scripture where Paul says a very similar thing to this, and then we're going to think our way through it. If you go to the book of Ephesians, Paul starts the letter to the Ephesians and he says, I'm writing to the saints who are in Christ Jesus. And he goes on to tell us what he means by that. He says, who are seated in heavenly places in Christ. I'm writing to the saints who are in Christ. That's what defines us. And then he says, the faithful who are in Ephesus. And he's talking to the people who showed up on the Sunday morning in Ephesus in the same way as you are the faithful in East London. And so as we work out our lives in the Lord, we do it in these two realities. Our one reality is the spirit reality, born again in Christ. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. 
And the other reality is I'm sitting on a hard chair in a cold building on a rainy Sunday morning in East London. And I'm worried about how I'm going to get through the week. And that's my, my other reality. And these two things, am I talking to the right people? Does anybody have this struggle? Yes. Everybody has this struggle. One more introductory statement, and then we're going to have some fun to the cameraman. If you can just get comfortable with a lot of movement around you. Um, I'm going to go home slightly fitter than I arrived this morning. If you've got a Christianity that is so focused on your natural human current reality that it struggles to believe any of the stuff that has happened to you, then you've got a Christianity that is powerless. All you're doing is bumping around, around trying to reform your own life in your own strength by going to church. You're not living by faith. You might as well take what Jesus did out of your Bible and just read all of the instructions and try and put them into practice. And many Christians, and especially the men, and look, I know it's not easy being a guy. We've already covered the man flu issue. There are others. We face other crises, like losing open ga opening games in the World Cup and stuff. And, I mean, that can really put us down for years at a time. Ladies, you have no idea. I should do a seminar. But men have got this thing, I'm not spiritual. So I just go along and, you know, all the ladies are spiritual and there are a couple of spiritual guys, but I'm not spiritual. And you sentence yourself to a Christianity that is bogged down in your own humanity and you can't think a thought beyond your own mind and you can't move anything beyond your own strength because you deny the reality that you've been born again into, and it's unhelpful. Then there are other folks who really get the fact that they are new creations. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Made perfect in Christ. I believe it with my whole heart. But they, they believe that to the denial of their reality. And you all have a friend like that. And you don't know whether to admire their faith or pity their lunacy because they live in denial. They're in absolute agony. My leg's not sore. I'm healed in Jesus' name. My leg's not sore. What are they doing? They're denying their present reality by trying to sort of drown it in the confession of the new creation. And, um, And if anybody is really stuck in that model, if they are, and it's been said of them, they are, they are so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. If anybody is stuck in that mode, just leave them. Time will sort them out. Just, it's just the reality. Life has a way of giving us the odd slap that earths us and keeps us grounded. And I don't know whether I'm going to have time to get back there, but remember that Jesus was both. He was 100% God and He was 100% human. And so, in divine power and energy, He set demons to flight. He healed the sick. He performed the most extraordinary miracles, took authority over wind and waves. And at other times, He was tired and asleep in the boat. And at other times, He withdrew. He just had to get away from the crowds. And at times he was utterly shattered, saying, Father, if there's any way, if there's any other way, please. And so we see him in the fullness of his humanity, and we see him in the glories of his deity. And you and I similarly are caught in between. Something extraordinary has happened to us, and we're alive in Christ, seated in heavenly places, new creations, completely and yet, here we are with our snivels and coughs and worries and foibles and troubles. And in the language of the Spirit this morning, our chains that need breaking. All right, I need two chairs and a volunteer. Dion is leaving the building. Dion is volunteering. 
Okay, that's good. I wasn't sure which way it was going to go. John, if we could have one chair down here on the, on the floor, please. I don't care which way it faces. I haven't really thought that through. And let's go big, man. Let's put the other one right up here somewhere in a lofty and exalted place. So if we're going to refer to First Timothy, we're going to talk about the two Pauls. Now, you know there was only one Paul, hey? There's only one Paul. Dion, for that wonderful bit of servanthood, would you please be Paul? Just briefly. Just briefly. Just for the weekend. Nah. Yeah. So Paul is an apostle. Appointed by God. He's the recipient of strength, of grace, of faith, of love, of mercy. He's been found faithful, and when he speaks and writes, he does so with great authority. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. He used to be an opposer, a persecutor. He used to be a really nasty piece of work. And by the way, his past always bothered him. In Acts 22, when he faces the crowd in Jerusalem and he's being arrested, he gets up and he says, I was there when they were stoning Stephen. And do you know what I did to the people of God? And then he's arrested, he's taken up to Caesarea, and two years later, he comes on trial between Festus, before Festus and Agrippa, and he tells the same story. He says, you, you have no idea who I was. And Paul's not confused about the fact that when he believed in Jesus, he was united with Jesus in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension. He was no longer in Adam. He is now in Christ. He is righteous. His old has been removed from him as far as the east is from the west. He has, he's not confused about any of that stuff. But then he tells us in, in 1 Timothy, he tells us wonderfully, perplexingly, it's what we're turning our minds around this morning, that he, if you could change chairs please, Paul, that he is also the worst of sinners, the chief of sinners. And for most of us, we get these two things, but we don't know how to put them together. And the result is confusion. No clarity of thought. Confusion. On Sunday, we pull the apostle. By Tuesday, we pull the worst of sinners. We drag ourselves into connect group, put on worship CDs in the car, sing our heads off, pray in tongues, read our Bibles, somehow scramble back into this chair, only to have a bumper bashing lunchtime on Thursday and find ourselves right back in chief of sinners seat. So, so we, we understand this problem. Paul didn't have a problem. There's an understanding issue. Okay. So, Dion, thank you. Thank you for playing Paul. That was magnificent. I'm now going to give you four things about these two seats. I'm going to give you four things. If I was writing a book, this would be the introductory chapter. If you want the rest, you're going to have to get me back. I'm going to charge for chapter two. Okay. I've learned from all these Okies on YouTube. You get the first chapter free and then subscribe and sign up and once they've got your email address, oh, they've got you. But, but here we go. First truth. We mistakenly think that this chair down here is natural us and that chair up there is spiritual us. Bad thinking. If that's what you think, you're always going to be confused. Remember, before you were a Christian, you weren't in that chair up there. Before you were a Christian, you did not have Paul's problem. You were not born again of the Spirit. The old hadn't gone anywhere. There was just you. Can I borrow another volunteer, Gail? Come and, come and be unbelieving, Gail. This is, 
This is before she became a Christian Gail. Before she became a Christian Gail, Gail was not seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. She had not been united with Christ in His crucifixion, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and His ascension. She, she had never heard of being seated in heavenly places. She was not a co-heir of Christ, and she was not a co-laborer with Him. She might have tasted of the grace and beauty and glory that is in the Lord. She might have gone up a mountain one day, and Jesus just drawn near to her. Scripture is clear that through created things, we can see His glory. Maybe a friend brought her along to church, and during the praise and worship, she really just sensed something other. So she's aware of the smell of heaven. <laughs> she smelt it, she's tasted it, she's touched it, but she hasn't yet entered into it. She is just good old in Adam Gale. That's it. She ain't got another chair to go to. Because no one has shared the gospel with her. She has not yet believed in Jesus, or more accurately, believed into Jesus. And when we believe into Jesus, it's a baptism. It's an immersion. Holy Spirit takes us and He plunges us into Christ. And it's like throwing a cup into the ocean. If you throw a cup into the ocean, is the cup in the ocean or is the ocean in the cup? Well, it's both. And so when we believe, Holy Spirit takes us and He plunges us into Christ. And Paul uses this language again and again and again. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. But also, you are born again by the Spirit of God and Christ is in you. The water is in the cup and the cup is in the water. It's both. But before Gail was born again, it was not possible at all for her to have any understanding of other Paul, because she was purely only human. You get it. One more important point. When Gail was only human, she was very spiritual. Go and ask any Buddhist who does not know Jesus at all, whether they are spiritually aware, and they will tell you, of course. Go and find a Sangoma doing offerings over some weekend in the rural areas and ask him, do you believe in the spirit world? He will say, of course I do. Go and find a new age shaman guru somewhere in one of the major centers playing with their crystals and their chakras and all this stuff. They are spiritually aware. So just because you are human does not mean that you are unspiritual. Just because we are spiritually dead, that's where the confusion comes in. Just because we are separated from God doesn't mean that we are unspiritual. And we don't serve people well when we treat them as unspiritual. Many non-Christians are more spiritual than most Christians. They're more spiritually aware. And strangely enough, when you get into church and you talk about spiritual things, we all go, oh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> we are the most unbelieving bunch of believers anywhere. So just because you're unsaved doesn't mean you're unspiritual. And these two chairs are not the difference between being natural and being spiritual. They're the difference between old creation and new creation realities. And that's a different thing. So everybody in East London, walking and breathing in East London, wherever we go tomorrow, is in one way or another sitting in the bottom chair, just like Gail is sat. Thank you, Gail. That's point one. Yeah, we'll do, we'll do the, the Christian Center Oscars or BAFTAs or whatever um, at the end of the meeting. Second truth about these two seats. When you are born again, can I have another volunteer? Come on, one of you two. I've got to get you some red carpet time here. 
Thank you, princess. When you are born again, let's start here. You believe in Jesus, right? You hear the gospel, and the first gift that the gospel gives you is faith. It helps you to believe. So we think about our faith, but faith actually comes from God too. It comes from hearing. It's an importation. It's given us. Faith comes, the gospel comes. And all of us in this room, there is a moment in which we believed. And the moment in which we believed, Holy Spirit took us. I'm going to grab you by the hoodie here. Please come with me so that we don't end up in a fight. Thank you. <laughs> this is good. Holy Spirit takes us and He immerses us in Christ. The cup in the ocean and the ocean in the cup. And He moves us. Now we've got to go all the way to the top chair. He moves us, in the language of Ephesians, from being dead in our transgressions and sins to being alive in Christ and seated in heavenly places. It is an entirely supernatural, transformative, creative journey. In that moment, and I'm going to use a bit of provocative language, which I'll pick up just now, in that moment, He makes us a new species. We are all together different. We are born from above. We are born of God. So, my question to you is, what is left sitting in the bottom chair? There's nothing sitting in the bottom chair. Then who am I talking to here this morning? Who are you? If your Christianity says that there's nothing left in the bottom chair, then how come you spend 168 hours a day resolving very practical problems like what to eat and how to get your car fixed and how to find enough money and how to educate your kids and how to get your headache to go away and how to deal with your fear and how to get the local authorities to do something about the pothole outside your driveway. If there's nothing left on the bottom chair, how come you put 168 hours into living out of the nothing? Can you see why we're confused? What is left at the bottom here, and we're going to work with language a little bit, is not the old person. What is left at the bottom here is the vestiges of the old person. What is the Afrikaans word for vestige? What's the closer word for vestige? Come on, talk to each other, talk to me. We need to get clear on this stuff. We need words for it. What is left behind? Okay, I'm going to use the word vestige or vestigial. And the best way I can explain it to you is this. When the silkworm goes into the cocoon, it goes into the cocoon as its old life. When it comes out of the cocoon, it comes out of the cocoon in its resurrection life. But the cocoon doesn't disappear, and there are all sorts of bits and pieces left in the cocoon. Those are the vestiges of the worm. The worm that became a pupa, I think, if I remember my high school biology. And so there, is, there are remains. Paul in 1 Timothy is calling those remains the foremost of sinners, because it has the potential to sin terribly. Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, called it the faithful in Ephesus. But those were the remains of an old life. The Scripture is clear that your old nature has been put to death, co-crucified with Christ, and that you have been born again, you have been given a new nature. So, thank you, princess. Your, your name is in the hat for the BAFTA Awards. Thank you so much. So, when we talk about the two Pauls, or the two Gavins, or the two you, put your name in the blank. The one you is the new creation in Christ Jesus. The other you is the living, breathing, hamburger-loving, series-watching, vestigial remains. 
of the old you. And you live with it 168 hours a week. And you work out a relationship with it 168 hours a week. Got to get this. It's not you. It's something that is fading away. Paul said that it's a tent being taken down. So this you, the born again you, top seat you, is coming. Because the power of the future has burst in on you. And you've tasted and you've received. And to grow in Christ is to grow in this reality, new creation realities. But you haven't yet been delivered from the vestiges of your old creation, your old Adam suit. This is why in church we celebrate resurrection, but we still have funerals. Born again, Glorious new creation you is never going to need healing. Vestigial you might have a couple of aches and pains from time to time. So are you ready for this? Here comes point number two, and I hope I'm not taking too long. Vainant, it feels like we, we're going too slowly. New creation you, this is eternal reality. It is immutable, which means it's unchangeable. It is transcendent, eternal. It's not as if God just came into our world, but God has invited us into His world. Huge thought. And here we are, the chief of sinners, the worst of sinners. Hopefully we'll stay, the faithful in East London. But we deal with that reality every single day of our lives. And that reality is changeable. And it's not transcendent. And it's not eternal. It's temporal. It's variable. This new covenant, new creation reality is a constant. It never changes. This leftovers, the remains, the vestiges of my life, highly variable, not at all constant. Doing well on Sunday, doing badly on Monday. Great day on Wednesday, terrible day on Thursday. This reality, an absolute constant. You get it. Where should we take our identity from? Who is the real you? I would argue strongly that the real you is the new creation you. And I would argue strongly that what is left it's fundamentally going to fade. If you set your identity in what is left behind, you'll never amount to very much. Okay. Here comes a big thought. And I'm still on point two. Point two is the big thought. As the church, we make a mistake when we pour all our energy in trying to fix vestigial Gavin. So we try and deliver him, we try and heal him, we try and educate him, we try and pray him into shape, we try and fast him into shape. We spend a whole lot of work trying to get this guy to look like that guy. And we can never get it right because we start in the wrong place. We're trying to fix what is unfixable. The way this guy changes is we live, and we'll get there just now, we live from up here. We bring these realities to bear. We tell vestigial Gavin, That new creation, Gavin, is perfect in Christ. And the demons must go. Because all of the authority is in top chair. We're not trying to fix bottom chair. We're trying to get ourselves established in top chair. Get it? Okay. Third point. Now I'm going to stretch you. 
sorry to have to do this to you, but someone should. So if you, hear me out, don't get offended. Don't lose the plot. It's been really good this far. <laughs> it's been really good and you've been lovely about it. You've all agreed that you're the worst of sinners and it's, it's what we've always expected. But, <laughs> but now I'm going to give you a thought that could really get stuck in your throat. So go and think, go and chew. When you and I were in Adam, remember when Gail was sitting down here, pre-believing in Christ, when you and I were in Adam, we were all less than Adam was ever created to be. We were subhuman, because Adam in the garden was a good representation of humanity. In fellowship with God, without sin. Can you imagine how strong just Adam and Eve's DNA must have been? How long would it have taken Adam to run 100 meters? Yo, I think he'd have been a 4.9er on a slow day, a muddy track. Just imagine the, the sheer quality of the engineering in Adam and Eve's DNA. After the fall, you and I in Adam, and it shows up through Adam's own bloodline, through his own children. This part of us, and the, even the vestiges of our old life, are so much less than humanity was ever meant to be. And it's why the world is in the mess it is. Look at how we treat each other. Look at how we destroy ourselves. We're no good on our own. This guy is subhuman. This guy, in Christ Gavin, that guy is superhuman. He is more than Adam ever was. How can you say that? Well, Adam was in the garden, but Adam was dependent on the tree of life that was outside of himself. He was not immortal. His mortality was dependent on feeding on the tree of life. All you had to do was separate him from the tree, and he became much less than what he was ever created to be. But you and I have the tree of life living in us. We have been born again by the Spirit of God. Am I calling you a little God? No, I'm not. That's the qualifier. We are not divine. But Peter says that we are partakers of the divine nature. Paul says that anyone who has the Spirit within him, anyone who's alive in God, is one spirit with God. We've been united with God. We are born again of the Spirit of God. It's a supernatural recreative work, and we are indwelt by the Spirit of God. You and I, despite the so obvious vestigial remains of our own life, in which we work out our Christianity 168 hours a week, despite all of that stuff, all of your foibles and your fears, all the stuff, you are born again of heaven, man. God lives in you. And that means that nothing is impossible. You can speak and demons flee. You can live in victory. You can heal the sick. You can expect miracles to happen around you. You can expect to function in superhuman ways. Get yourself a Superman t-shirt. But you'll never see it show up on the outside until you believe it on the inside. But who you are today, by definition is beyond what we can conceive of. Paul writing to the same Corinthians church, and it's interesting, it was a church in disarray. And by discipline, he calls them saints. He should have called them a bunch of useless palookas. But he calls them saints. And then he says to them, 
eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it occurred, can be conceived by the mind of man, what God has prepared for those who love Him. This glory is extraordinary. And so we live with this dilemma every day of our lives. This is my third point. We live in this dilemma where we are so consciously aware of us being subhuman, substandard, less than. When our bodies are in trouble, when our wife has a migraine and we pray for her and nothing happens, when we've been financially good stewards and we're trusting the Lord for supply and nothing seems to flow, and, and we, 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 get, we get locked in to what remains of an old life, and its reality bites so firmly that it begins to become our identity. And we start to live at much less than God has ever asked us to. And because we're struggling in our own lives to keep it together, in the secret place of our own hearts to keep it together, we don't think we can ever take the gospel to anybody else. And the fight of faith is migrating your identity from what is left of your old life to agreeing in every way with your new life. On the days you can see it with your own eyes and on the days that you can't. I am a new creation. I am in Christ. All things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How about this one? Galatians 2.20. I have, Paul speaking, been crucified with Christ. He's been taken by the Spirit. And he's been brought into new creation realities. And he says, the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. And so you and I are involved in a daily struggle, and it's called the fight of faith. And it happens between our ears. Where are we going to place our agreement? Are we going to agree with what is left of an old creation? Or are we going to agree with everything God has said is true and constant in terms of my new creation realities. I choose, I choose, I choose, I choose. Many Christians have spent a lifetime trying to knock the old cocoon into shape. They've been so zoed and soaked and inner healed and delivered I heard someone once say, we need deliverance from inner healing and inner healing from deliverance. We've been at it so hard for so long. And you don't help people get free. But you don't help them get free by fixing, walking, talking them. You help them get free by showing them who they are in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, to the saints who are in Christ Jesus. New creation realities. There are many ways of saying this, and I'm coming in for landing now. Many ways of saying this. This Gavin, this Gavin feasts off the tree of life. That Gavin is an expert in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This Gavin can find peace and joy and strength and wisdom at the drop of a hat, no matter what he's going through, because he's one with God and God lives in him. That Gavin has got little strength, little wisdom, cannot endure. That Gavin thinks with the best that his mind can come up with. This Gavin has been given the mind of Christ. This Gavin is righteous with the righteousness of Christ himself. The best that Gavin has to offer is self-righteousness, and it's not worth much. This Gavin is alive and lives and gives life 
that Gavin is dying, fading away, trapped in his mortality and has got nothing to offer anybody else. You get the point. Big thought. Stay with me. Big thought. Romans 8. The Bible calls this living in the Spirit. The Bible calls that, and I'm going to give you a biblical word for vestigial Gavin. The Bible calls that your flesh. That's your flesh. And you will either live according to your flesh or you will live according to the Spirit. Those are your choices. Every day. You can't go by your feelings. It's got nothing to do with being spiritual. Even unsaved people are spiritual. It's got to do with deciding whether you will live according to the flesh or whether you will live in the Spirit. This Gavin thrives on truth. That Gavin thrives on deception and lies. This Gavin is obsessed with Jesus. That Gavin is obsessed with self. You get it. Closing thought. And you can start to jazz up the mood because we're going to break every chain at the top of our voices in a very short period of time. Before the incarnation, before Jesus, temples were buildings made by human hands. The incarnation, the new covenant, introduced an entirely new order of things. And in Christ, the fullness of the deity dwelt bodily. And you and I are born again after the order of Jesus. We were taken out of Adam, our original ancestor, and we were placed into Christ. And what a mystery. You are a temple of God. And so what you do with what is left over doesn't matter. Paul elsewhere describes it as a clay jar filled with treasure. But it doesn't matter what you do with your body. It doesn't matter what you do with your time. What you put into your ears, what you put into your eyes. Of course it matters. But those things don't save you. All those things do is reflect where you are in the fight of faith, which reality you are living out of. And you and I have been made after the pattern of Jesus. He's our pattern case. Our humanity, on my wedding day, I cleaned up well. But most of the time, it's not that great. And then, there is in Christ me, and it's an entirely different matter because it's cut from the cloth of Jesus himself. I'm not divine, but I am one with him, and he is inside of me, and God is my Father, and the Holy Spirit is within me. Hallelujah. So I'd love us to go back to the song that we ended with. And all I want you to do is to the best of your understanding, because of course there aren't two chairs. There's only one chair. You're sitting on it. You're in both of these places every day, all the time. And the duality, there's not two of you, there's one of you. And as you struggle your way through life on earth, and it can be a struggle, it doesn't define you. The struggle doesn't define you place I first learned this was at the deathbed of an old colored lady in Coxstad, Tani Marie. When I first met her, she first started coming to the church, I went to visit her and it was winter, it's cold in Coxstad. And she had everything she owned on. Every item clothing she owned, she had on and she was sitting wrapped in blankets because she couldn't afford any electricity. She had a heater but she couldn't afford to power it. And that extremely poor old lady who was the matriarch of a very big family who spent her days on her knees for her grandchildren, who always took in a grandchild 
or a great-grandchild or anybody else who needed help. Her little shack, her little house was a rehabilitation center. Many, many, many family members went through there, coming off drugs, coming off the streets, coming out of divorces. Tony Marie fell ill, and she was in bed, and I'm not a medical person, but she wasn't with it. She was effectively, she was still breathing. Her body was still alive, but there was nobody there. And four or five of us went to go and pray with her, and we went to pray a prayer of release. By then, she was in her 80s, and it was time not for her to linger and suffer, but it was time for her to let go of the cocoon and to go and be with the Lord. And we stood around the bed and we started singing in the spirit, singing in tongues. And Tani Munre joined us. Nothing changed about her physical body. But the real Tani Marie was still in that body, <laughs> wrapped in Jesus. And when she heard that worship, it stirred her to one last burst. For 10 minutes, we stood in the glory of the Lord at Tony Marie's deathbed. And within half an hour, all that was left was the remains, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, just the cocoon. Tony Marie was gone. But before my eyes as a young pastor, I could see the reality of these two things. And I'm just so privileged to have known Tony Marie. Because she lived in the worst of circumstances, but she lived from heaven. There was always enough because God said there was enough. She could always do it because God said she could do it. She was never confused. Even if she was sitting in all her clothing, wrapped in all of her blankets, shivering, she had learned, let's quote Paul, to be content. She lived in victory. She lived in a, a level of victory that my heart yearns for, for me. I think we've got bad pictures of what heaven's like, and so I'm even naughty doing this because I don't think it's true. <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm going to see her in heaven because I'm going to be up in the cheap seats and she's going to be down the front with the archangels. Our value and the size of our faith has got nothing to do with our circumstances, people got everything to do with where we live in our inner man and the truth is that Jesus broke every chain on resurrection Sunday none of us have to live with addictions none of us have to be run live run ragged with fear none of us need to be consumed by our weaknesses they're inevitable there are bits of your humanity that are going to plague you and irritate you for the rest of your life, not to mention what they're going to do to your wife and to the rest of us. And Paul tells us, tells us the reason why all of this glory is in all of that unimpressive clay jar that everybody knows that the glory is His. It's His perfect patience. It's His perfect grace. It's His perfect salvation. You get it. So all I'd love us to do, is let's use this song, Breaks Every Chain. He's broken every chain. It's done. We experience it in time. But his once for all sacrifice has done it all. Let's, let's move our chairs, our internal chairs. Let's take this chair and say, I'm no longer going to empower you. I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to become one of those loopy weirdo Christians but I'm going to live from life when someone says to you oh you've got aches and pains, old age is not for sissies, inside you say don't believe that I'm not going to let the prison of what's left dictate my future I'm going to live to the best of my ability every day out of the truths that God has spoken.